Hey everyone, we're back here on um, Studio Scotch Podcast with Hugh Mitchell, Paddy Hayes and guest speaker Chris Binns, who is a um, editor for the Red Bull Surfing. Can you just give us a bit of insight into that? Um, well, as you can imagine, Red Bull's a big international brand. Obviously, it makes a fizzy drink, but it also has a huge media house. I work for the Red Bull Media House um, as a consultant on the surfing front. Uh, a lot of people would think that Red Bull is an American company. It's actually in Austria, so they're based out of Salzburg. Um, and as you can imagine, they're mountain folk more than s- the ocean goers, so I'm their surfing consultant and, and help with all things on their website. Um, a lot of content, everything v- from video to photo to, to written. So just um, from a day-to-day basis, what would that job involve? <sighs> Um, I always get asked what I do and I still don't have a good answer. None of my mates know um, and I like to keep it that way. But, uh, well, these days, I mean, social media is everywhere. So a lot of uh, involvement in everything that goes out on Red Bull Surfing social channels. Um, And then because they sponsor a huge team of athletes, you need to coordinate everything involving those guys. There's a lot of bigger video projects as well that... I'm not so involved with, but you'll be involved with the rollout of. So someone, you know, Jack Robinson might do a video edit and then I will build out the story on the website and work with the photographers to get the stills for a gallery and, you know, do an interview with Jack and then roll it out on the website. Awesome. Another thing I heard you're involved in was Guru Productions. Yeah, I, I worked with them um, for about eight or nine months last year, which is a local TV um, production company here in Perth. They do a lot of Channel 9 content, so stuff like uh, Destination WA, um, Our State on a Plate, Explore TV and that kind of stuff. Um, so working with a few personalities, go, uh, you know, like Sherry Lee Biggs and yeah. um, oh, Pete... Uh, What's his name? Pete Canelli, maybe? 94.5, and he's the game day host at the Dockers games, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah awesome. So uh, is, is surfing something you hold quite close to your heart? or? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I didn't necessarily grow up surfing because I grew up in Calamunda. Oh, yeah. Um, but I always loved surfing. Um I couldn't stand the fact that you Scotch guys live right here on the beach and I just have to catch the train in from Guildford. But, um, yeah, loved it. Always loved writing as well. Um, I had a family connection who worked at a surfing magazine uh, on the Gold Coast. And so all of my childhood I had a subscription uh, to Surfing Life. And eventually through a love of... I, I used to love languages as well. Did English, Lit and French um, for TE. Um, and just loved writing and it all sort of came together I started writing freelance contributing to surfing magazines and uh, there's a a much longer version of it but eventually I ended up working for Surfing Life magazine on the Gold Coast which is the one I grew up reading and uh, yeah sort of 20 years after I first got a subscription I end up as the editor-in-chief of Surfing Life magazine so it was this crazy sort of full circle um, moment that came together combining two of my great loves writing and surfing and then it's just become this stepping stone to this um career that i still can't quite (laughs) put a label to that's so cool how did it feel when you like first got the job or how did you actually get that job i know you said it's complicated but was there a moment where you got a job offer and it was so i there's a magazine or it's a media outlet these days in sydney called stab or they're in byron now um and that was a new magazine that came out right about the time I was at university um, straight out of university I went and worked FIFO I think probably before FIFO was an acronym like <laughs> yeah. I just used to go and work on the pipeline lay barges up north uh, and I was making huge money back then for like a 23 year old and I started contributing to STAB um, and then on my time off it was basically a, almost like an unpaid internship where I'd fly to Sydney and I'd crash with one of the editors and I'd hang out in the office and caption photos and do stuff for the website and get more and more articles published and then they started to pay me for the articles that were getting published and a penny dropped that I could start making money writing about something I loved as opposed to being covered in dirt yeah 
going away offshore for a month at a time. Money's not <laughs> even close to comparable, uh, but the lifestyle was fantastic. Um, and yeah, I ended up, I was doing a bunch of traveling. I was backpacking around in, I think I was in America, saw an, a job advertised at Surfing Life, which was where the dream all began. Yep. Applied for it online. Um, I think uh, they replied to me by that time I was in Italy. I eventually had my first phone interview when I was in France. Yeah. Uh, and then eventually ended up getting the job. I was in San Sebastian in Spain. And um, yeah, ended up flying home, had one night in Perth and flew off to the Gold Coast. Oh, amazing. So what was the uh, the nature of like these articles that you were writing? Like were they in competitions, different surf breaks? So the very first one I ever wrote was... Um, I ended up just getting in contact with the guys from this magazine and they said, oh, what do you do with yourself? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm working on these pipeline lay barges. And this was kind of when FIFO was becoming a thing, so there was still quite a lot of mystery to it. And they said, oh, what, you know, what's it like if, if you fall off one of these oil rigs? Do you get eaten by a shark? Like, what do you guys do for a month out there? Are there other surfers out there? You know, what do they do with all their money? And, and I wrote this thousand-word piece that I read it now and it feels like I was primary school kid writing <laughs> this story but um just sort of i was lucky there were some great characters on board on my shift who i sort of interviewed and got bits and pieces about my dad's an engineer so he could tell me some of the factual stuff and yeah sent them back this story and they published it and paid me 300 bucks and i was like oh i could do more of this yeah. and it just all stemmed from there so your work obviously involved a lot of interviews and things along those lines. And now that you're at Red Bull editing, you must have worked with some pretty big names. Can you tell us maybe a few of the biggest you've worked with? Oh, in surfing, all of them. Um, <laughs> at the magazine, um, yeah, and it was a it was a heyday. Um, you know, obviously Kelly Slater will stand alone as the goat, and I've done plenty with Kelly over the years. Um, got a pretty decent relationship with Mick Fanning. Good friends with Taj Burrow done plenty with Steph Gilmore and then all the way through to the modern generation like you know to, through Red Bull now to work with Jack Robinson Griffin Colapinto um, I, I when I was still at the magazine uh, events used to have media partnerships with the various magazines and often one of the requirements of a media partner was that they would provide a commentator uh, and so I ended up commentating quite a few events realized I quite liked it a lot of people don't they get awkward when they get on a microphone but I felt quite comfortable uh, and so that's gone on since I've left the magazine is I continue to commentate lots of events as well so I have a foot in a lot of camps I work for Red Bull which is a brand I work for the WSL which is the governing body of surfing uh, and then I'll work for other magazines and whatnot as well so I sort of float around and I cross paths with lots of people and often with lots of different hats on and it's funny the relationship you have with someone if you're coming to them as you're working for the same brand that sponsors them or if you're coming to them as a journalist or if you're hanging out with them as a friend it's uh yeah it's it's an interesting mix yeah that's awesome sounds like a pretty crazy lifestyle really is there a way that you balance everything and try to fit it in or is there times where it just becomes crazy and times when it drops off um, I found three jobs at once is too many. Yeah. <laughs> um, often uh, the problem when you work for yourself is someone offers you something and if you say no, they won't come back to you again. Yeah. So when you're getting started, you just say yes to everything. And then often you find yourself juggling three or four different things at the same time and it gets a little bit too much. So then as you get deeper into your career it, it's a little bit more of a luxury if you've established yourself and people want to work with you that you can start saying no and that's actually a really good feeling because you're <laughs> yeah. like you, you, you feel better about yourself even though you're turning down money and definitely my career has been a lesson in not making money yeah uh, but having a fantastic time i've traveled the world for the last 15 years and you know, made amazing mates all around the planet and have great relationships with, um, you know, plenty of the world's best surfers and their sponsors as well. Cool. So you say you've done some commentating. Uh, which surf break do you reckon has been your favourite to uh, commentate at? That's a really good question. Depends on your metric. I mean, um, 
from a spectacle point of view, uh, I commentated the Cape Fear event at Shipstone Bluff in Tasmania uh, about five years ago, which is a three-hour boat ride to get out to. Um, you're on a boat the whole time. There's 15-foot waves breaking 20 feet away from you, um, and it's just a crazy, crazy yeah, day. Um, but then I'd rather go to... Jeffrey's Bay in South Africa just because I want to surf there yeah, and hang out. Yeah. It's, it's just such an amazing place. Um, oh, I don't know. I've, I've, I love so many of them for so many different reasons. If you're in Hawaii and you're standing on the beach at Pipeline or, you know, the Eddie I Cow when that runs at Waimea, mm. you, you sort of feel like you're at the Boxing Day Test or a Grand Final or something like that where it's just a, a pinnacle of the sport yeah. and the energy from the crowd and the competitors, it's all at another level. Uh, obviously, the events in Australia are fun because you're travelling around, catching up with mates and uh, everything's comfortable. I love going to Portugal, love going to France. Um, Indonesia is somewhere I've lived for a long time um, and when there were championship tour events there that they were just fantastic to be a part of um yeah it's hard to fault any of them i mean i i've been lucky enough to go to taiwan three times to commentate events and these unlikely places are sometimes some of the best um you know you you no one knows who you are or what you're doing you, you're carrying these huge surfboard bags through an airport and people are looking at you like <laughs> who are these guys yeah. um and then you turn up in the middle of nowhere and there's a fun little wave and you're just eating dumplings and cruising around town <laughs> on bicycles going, this is fantastic. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you, you make the most of wherever you are, um, and, but there's definitely some places where you, you, your eyes light up if you get the invite to go back. I just want... Uh, talking about Shipstons, obviously everyone's got some attraction to big waves. What's it like actually being in the water with that, the guy, or not necessarily in the water, no, but on I the boat? I wasn't getting off the boat. <laughs> with the guys that are like then paddling into these giant waves. Oh, it's crazy. Uh, I was lucky enough to be in Fiji in 2012 um, for what was known as the Thundercloud Swell. Uh, the competition, the waves got so big that the actual competition was called off, and then the afternoon just turned into this spectacle of guys just riding 30 foot tubes for four or five hours and it was like nothing i've ever seen even just sitting on the boat you know the waves are so big that when the spit comes out of the barrel you're 50 feet away getting soaked um and just seeing the way that guys were psyching themselves up to get out there and seeing these waves that you could easily fit a semi-trailer inside yeah. of, you just it's mind-blowing um i was on the beach at the uh, Red Bull Cape Fear event that was held at Cape Salander in, in yeah. Yeah. Sydney in 2016, which was probably by consensus of anyone who surfs the, the craziest, most sketchy psycho event that's ever been held. And that wasn't enjoyable as a spectator because every time someone took off, you thought that you might be about to witness something pretty uh, dangerous. Yeah. And it was, yeah, by the time they called the event off, everyone was just... <laughs> Thankful that they were all okay. Yeah. That, yeah, well, there were a couple of people who got hurt, yeah. and that was why it did get called off. And it was just an eerie, eerie feeling, because every time someone took off, you were just, like, gripping your knuckles going, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, thankfully, in the end, the couple of guys who got hurt, it was nothing serious, and they were able to finish the event the next day in still insane conditions, but not as nuts as it had been the day before wow so just as a commentator for anyone who doesn't watch surfing um what does that involve and because obviously you're out in the water but what does the task like actually involve it how far away from the waves you all those sort of things yeah good question so there's two types of commentators at at a surfing event um generally there's a broadcast and they're the guys who are sitting on camera telling you what's going on and they're just talking to the audience who's tuning in um, and then there's also the beach commentators who not only talk to the crowd who are on the beach, but tr uh, relay information to the surfers in the water. So they're quite important because they're giving the surfers scores and updates and reading out priority and that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> it's two... I, I do both. Um, I 
mainly do beach commentary on the championship tour at the highest level because the broadcast crew is all pretty locked in there. Mm. Uh, and then I'll do a lot of webcast stuff on the qualifying series, challenger series and whatnot. And uh, it, it's two different ball games as a commentator because when you're reading out scores to the surfers, you're vitally important to them. And if you stuff it up, they get mad at you. And I've had plenty of the world's best surfers get upset with me. Yeah. Um, but you're also trying to entertain the crowd. So you're, you're giving them information, you're giving the surfers vital information, but you can't really get to editorial because the surfers can hear you as well. So if Hugh blew a wave and I was to say, well, that was he's off to a shocker here, he's going to hear that. And yeah. so you need to keep that kind of chat out of there. Whereas if you're on the webcast and it's just the TV viewers at home, you can be like, oh, he looks like he's got the wrong board today and you know <laughs> what, what's going on. And you can, you can be a bit more... Um, of a, of a commentator rather than someone who just relays information. Um, I also do a lot of sideline, the, the post-heat interview and that kind of stuff, which I love, getting to talk to all the surfers when they're fresh out of the water um, and just getting to have a chat and, you know, have them run us through it and bring the experience to the viewer at home who's watching on. I think that's just fantastic. And those jobs you can often, that's where you end up, sitting in the channel in the water or you can be on a boat um i i think it was it was actually 2020 right before the pandemic hit i was in portugal for the wsl big wave event at nazare and i was the sideline reporter so i was on a boat in the channel with 80 foot waves popping around trying not to get seasick and every interview we did was like hanging off the side of a boat <laughs> to a guy who was on a jet ski and you're kind of hugging each other so that you're not drifting apart and uh everyone was like oh that would have been incredible but i didn't see a thing because we were behind the break so i was just seeing these huge yeah. swell lines come in you just see 80 foot of swell coming towards you and then you go over it and then you see the back of a wave play out towards the cliff and you don't actually have a clue what's happened so we're all trying to watch the webcast on our phones that's crazy uh one other thing i want to ask about is obviously you interact with the whole range of different surfers so you got the professional surfers the big wave surfers and then also the guys who kind of just do the video stuff yep would you call them semi-pro or what how would you uh a lot of them are surprisingly a lot more professional than you think oh really okay yeah, yeah. so the free they're free surfers yeah um, free surfers. yeah to be a good free surfer especially now because yeah. the industry's struggling a little bit and the big sponsorship contracts just aren't there or there are less of them you you actually have to work really hard yeah. um it's probably you have to work even harder if you're on the world tour you just show up at an event and compete and you're doing your job mm. but if you are sponsored by billabong and your job is you're getting paid by billabong to showcase their wetsuits and their clothing and that kind of thing you can't just go surfing. You have to be in touch with photographers. You have to be in touch with filmers who are going to film you surfing. You have to make sure that your social media presence is on the go. You have to be talking to Billabong and saying, hey, there's a swell coming next week. Any chance you can fly me to go here and we'll get this guy to film? And then they'll say, sure. And then the week after that, everyone's going to Bali. We're doing a board short shoot. You need to be here at this time. So you're just yeah, constantly wow. on the go. Whereas... A lot of people think it's just like, yeah, these cool guys who hang around and, and go surf every now and then. But that might have been the case once upon a time. Not anymore. You have to work at it. And do you think that's also part of the challenge? Like they have to make it seem like they're that cool guy just hanging around and surfing? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, yeah. they are still, you know, those cool guys, but they're, they're also a lot smarter than yeah. you might think. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. When it comes to like the world of sports editing what would be like your biggest advice for anyone wanting to get into it based on your experiences great question uh i think mine was always just one of my mantras is if you don't ask you don't get yeah and just knocking on doors and sending emails and asking to get a go and you know you might get nine no's but the one yes will open up you know maybe next time you get Two yeses. Um, yeah, just if, if you want something, go after it and ask questions and make it happen. But also be prepared to back up your talk. When I was at the magazine, we used to get lots of um, emails from people who were chasing jobs. And 
they'd have this fantastic email spiel, but you're like, oh, this sounds a little bit rehearsed. And then you'd reply with a few more questions and realize that there was no substance to it. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you do want it, then make sure if you do get a chance, you, you're all in and you're prepared and ready for it. Yeah. How would you say that's related to you? Because obviously you have a big social media presence now, so it'd be easier to get, like you said, you can get any job. Um, I definitely gun. can't get any job. <laughs> Most <laughs> I jobs. still cough a lot of no's. Really? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, well, how would you say that's related to you? Do you constantly ask around for new jobs or...? Always. Yeah, I'm self-employed, so if I don't go chasing work, um, you know, bits and pieces come my way, but I'm still sending emails all the time to people going, hey, and pitching work. I mean, because I'm kind of a jack-of-all-trades journo, it might be... I want to write an article on this person or I might want to produce a video series on this person and I'll pitch it to this this crew and, and that sponsor and see what comes of it. Would you say your social media presence like helps you with that? Not really. I'm not sure where that actually came from um, and it's not huge, but uh, it definitely helps with regard to if I'm in an event, I'll make sure that I'm posting around the event and tagging the event and sharing and it's it's just awareness that there's there's so many events and competitions going on all the time that a lot of them can slip through the cracks um so i guess occasionally i'll post knowing that people are going to see it and they might want to tune in but also people who've employed me are like oh this guy's you know doing a decent job of letting people know that the event's happening yeah fair enough also, so you started working with surfing. Do you plan to expand into any other sports or you want to just keep sticking down the surfing track? For well, this is where I keep yeah. getting hip, getting nose from Red Bull because I'm like, I want to, I'd happily commentate any of these wacky sports you make up where guys, you know, <laughs> jumping off cliffs and yeah, doing yeah. all this stuff. I'm like, there's no experts in that field. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I can be as clueless as the next guy. Give me a go. Um, Oh, I, I would happily work in, in any sport. I, I love all sport. Yeah, um, yeah. And the Dockers tragic. Um, <laughs> this is our year. <laughs> Flag man all the way. Every year. Every year. Rebuilding since 95. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I definitely, I, I don't like being showcased as just a surfing guy. Yeah. Um, that was one of the things I really enjoyed last year while I was working at Guru was doing more travel and um, sort of lifestyle and adventure and that kind of stuff and, and getting out of that realm. But you also see that skills are transferable mm. across it. Like I, I feel like, you know, the Shield finals on today, if someone said, do you want to go down to the Wacker and commentate it? I'd be like, yep, let's go. Awesome. And just do the research. Uh, you know, if you research... And, and have a decent base of knowledge before you talk about something, then you yeah. can back yourself. Yeah, exactly. I feel like it's one of those things where do you find if you know a lot about the topic, it's much easier than a job that you walk into where you might not know so much? Or is that one of your skills you've kind of developed over time? That you yeah, I mean, if you're passionate about something, obviously it's going to come through in everything that you do with it. But yeah. um, I just love researching stuff as well. Yeah, okay. So if it's like... You're going to interview Tom Cruise. I would have the best week on the internet beforehand just digging up the most random stuff about him. Yeah. And, and just like annoying the hell out of my mates, going like, oh, did you know that he was born in a bathtub in <laughs> yeah. Ohio? And just like have all this trivia. I love interviewing people and hitting them with questions where they're like, what? Yeah. How, how did do you, you get know that? that? <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, I always like, I, lo- I love interviewing people and. I don't want to name drop, but Kelly Slater's a great one. If you interview Kelly, if your first question's a dud and he just checks out and the interview will wrap up in like two minutes flat. Yeah. But if you get him with a couple of good ones straight off the bat, you can't shut the guy up. And it yeah. gets to the point, you're like looking at your watch going, man, we're 20 minutes in, I've got places to be. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's just having that chat and and once you've got a good line of conversation going keeping it going yeah like exactly. i can't stand watching an interview where someone's obviously got three or four questions in mind and they just rattle them off and meanwhile the second answer was this fantastic little tidbit and you're like well let's hear more about this and then yeah. they just move on to the next question 
yeah, spot on. Well, I th- uh, do you think like over time your interviewing's like progressively gotten better and better? Oh, yeah, massively. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's um, everyone's got a story, you know, and you you just have to dig it out of them. And if if you go into an interview thinking, oh, this guy's terrible, I'm not going to get much out of him, then that's going to come across, and you're yeah. not going to make much of an effort. Um, whereas if you know that you've done a little bit of research, you might find that someone you had no expectation of starts chatting with you and you're like, oh, this guy's great. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, so just uh, obviously you've become very good at um, interviewing. I was wondering if you could just give a practice interview <laughs> two minutes to Hugh. Oh, God. See, see um, just give a demonstration. Yeah, sure. I mean, I haven't done much research here. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> All right, Hugh, tell us about yourself. You, you're an old Scotch boy, I believe. Yeah, right. Yeah, I'm an old Scotch boy. I graduated in uh, 2021. And from there, I've pretty much gone straight into uni. I uh, started at UWA. And uh, kind of like the main thing, if we're talking on the surfing topic, I've started foiling pretty much 2019. So just before I graduated school. And then I've kept that going. We started this project called The Foil Project with a couple mates where we talk about foiling with some of the world leading foilers around the world. What was it about foiling that first got your attention? To be honest, the first time I ever saw foiling, I don't know if you've ever watched a Ben Gravy video, yep. but um, I remember I saw one video, he got a foil, and I was like, heard that these were the coolest things you could ever hear. Of. And he got up, and it just didn't work for him at all. Like He just came into the beach saying, this, this crap, this sucked. That might have been 2015. It was like ages ago. And I went, well, that would be a cool thing to do. And then it came round, COVID hit, and Dad went... Hugh, do you think it'd be a good idea if we tried this foiling stuff if in case we go into lockdown? And I went, yeah, that sounds great. How to go? And it's just the, the glide that you get. It's just like surfing, but for me, you can do it way more often when you live in Perth. Yeah, I was going to say, being a surfer in Perth, obviously yeah. we don't have the best conditions. Do you think that contributed to your um, passion for foiling? Yeah, 100%. Because you can do foiling any day. Like if it's windy, you can go. If it's not windy, you can go. And if there's no waves, you can go as well, which is great because you can't do that any other time. Um, is foiling kind of like the new kite surfing? I, th- I think it is in some ways. You might have seen wing foiling, which yep. is essentially similar to kite surfing, but it's much more, it's got a much greater range of skill sets. Like you can come into it as a complete novice, learn it quickly, and it's also much safer. What about the uh, e foils people are getting around on now? Uh, it's in the foil community, it's a bit debated, uh, I guess sort of a verging thing it's in some ways quite different because it's less of a sport and more of like a recreation i'd say if you're doing e-foiling is there an e-foiling oh sorry forget about the (laughs) e-foiling but is there is there foil competition these days it's starting and it's becoming how does it work what are you getting scored is it a wave catching contest or is it a from what i say i haven't been a part of any but from what i've seen that's crazy people are just coming up with whatever they want and it's like there's racing there's all these different like ranges of sports you've got kite foiling wing foiling wind foiling they've all got their own racing the other day i saw an event where it's like literally you catch a wave on the beach and then just pump down the beach and back like around a cone and that that's what they're calling racing so and then there's like the jumping tricks and everything it's literally endless whatever someone thinks up of becomes a little competition and everyone who uh goes foiling w- in waves yeah. says that it turns a one foot wave into feeling like it's a six footer is that the kind of thrill you get i think i think that's a pretty fair description uh, especially when you begin with because it's a pretty scary experience that first time where you feel like you're getting kicked out like you're on a bucking bull yeah because yeah. you, you have to get more over your front foot rather than your back exactly. is that the difference? Yeah. and coming from a surfer that feels really weird because surfing you know it's the exact opposite you want to go all the way back and uh, so is, is Kai Lenny kind of like the peak foil god or? Yeah, I think so. Actually, I was going to ask you, have you spoken to Kai Lenny before? Yeah, I've done a little bit with Kai actually. Yeah, okay. He's, um, yeah, every time I go to Nazare for an event, he's obviously a part of that. Yeah. Uh, I was also lucky enough a few years ago to go to the Maldives. Uh, there's an event called the Champions Trophy, which is originally it was meant to be for ex world champions and then they ran out of them pretty quickly um, and they just cycled through whoever whichever ex pros they can get it's at the four seasons uh which is like a you stay in a five thousand dollar a night villa it's just the biggest media junket wrought yeah the year i went uh the four competitors were joel parkinson josh kerr matt wilkinson and kyle lenny yeah and 
Kai is hilarious. He's an energized bunny of a human. Um, he doesn't drink. He and it shows. He, it's like he drinks Red Bull twenty four seven. The guy is out of control. He he rocks up with a more gear than you've ever seen. Every kind of board and wing and foil and kite imaginable. Yeah. And he uses them all. He he's unbelievable. And is he just nonstop all day? Is all that day. The thing? Yeah. All cool. day. And he's always like uh, I interviewed him once I was in Hawaii we were hosting a show at the Vulcan Pipe Pro and there'd been like a, a week before it was when Hawaii got this fake alert everyone on their on their iPhones got this alert saying that there was yeah. a, a missile inbound oh yeah and uh, the whole island went into a panic and anyway it was just someone in the office had pressed the wrong button and made a million people um, pack themselves but we were interviewing Kai and that came up and he was like wondering like if this missile had hit where the island would fall apart and if there would have been a surfable wave that came oh. out of it. It's just like, <laughs> what is wrong with this dude? <laughs> but that's him. He, he yeah. does not stop. And for whatever reason, he, um, he gets away with it. You won't hear anyone say a bad word about him. Whereas, you know, a guy like Laird Hamilton, who's, you know, Kai's the next evolution of that. Mm. Laird's not like super popular and he's kind of a bit of a, people see him as a bit of a joke whereas Kai it's like he's just respected by absolutely everyone yeah that's cool I mean obviously it, Kai would be kind of a role model of mine I think he's a pretty it sounds um, from the way you described him that's a pretty like admirable aspect he's oh got. yeah he's a really nice guy he's one of those dudes that always remembers your name like you know he would meet so many people who all want a part of him and then yeah. you see him he goes oh hey right on what's happening Chris how are you man <laughs> that's cool. awesome all right, I think we've got to start wrapping it up. So Yeah, well, I'd like to just say thank you to Chris for coming in today. I think it's been a great conversation. We've been able to learn quite a lot. And I just thank you guys for listening to Studio Scotch today. So take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having Thanks us. Thanks a lot, Chris.